I get a lot of questions from viewers all the time about selecting an industry or a business type that they should be pursuing when going out to buy a business. And today we're going to be talking about looking at industries. In particular, we're going to be talking about Michael Porter's five forces with respect to industry selection in the world of small businesses. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Are you thinking of growing your business or beginning a journey into entrepreneurship? Take a shortcut to success by buying an existing and profitable business the right way. Visit businessbuyeradvantage.com and learn more about my online training, group coaching, and consulting services designed to help you win. So I was reading a book uh, the other day uh, about business and it mentioned uh, Michael Porter and his five forces. And I was like, <clears throat> you know, I haven't really looked at that since I was in university studying business. And so I did a few Google searches and I came up with um, this website, which is um, from the people at uh, Harvard Business School. And so uh, Michael Porter um, actually uh, wrote in the 1979 Harvard Business Review, he wrote this article about these five forces that affect an industry. And basically it's a framework for understanding um, whether an industry is attractive or compelling, whether the margins or profitability in, the, in that industry would be higher or lower. And so it's an evaluation metric. And a lot of the things that you're going to see as we go through these five forces are things that people will naturally think about. You know, if they look at a particular kind of industry, they might think, hey, you know, um, is there a lot of competition in this industry or um, are there a customer concentration problems? Are there a few big customers, for example, or are there threats with respect to how the inputs come into this business? Um, you know, are there only a couple of suppliers, that kind of thing? And so on this website, and uh, I'll, I'll put a link to the to the actual website down below, but they they the people at Harvard, they, they talk about these five forces and then down below, they sort of give an example using the airline industry, um, which is you know a big business. And so I know that there's probably nobody in my audience thinking about starting or buying an airline. Um, so what I did is I went through the five forces and I created some examples from the world of small business so that, uh, that you can probably uh, imagine uh, as we go through these things. But the very first one is the threat of substitute products or services. So when you're looking at an industry, one of the questions is, um, what other options do people have outside of even choosing that industry? So for example, uh, a company that wants to have products delivered, um, they could hire a delivery company to go deliver those products, uh, or they could buy a truck and hire someone to drive it. Like that would be an example of a substitution, right? So uh, these options exist in practically everything outside of you know life-saving medications, right? And so if we think about the threat of substitutes, um, I'm going to compare everything here or talk within with respect to a lawn maintenance company and a restaurant because these are very common types of businesses that are analogous to a lot of other industries as well. So in the world of lawn maintenance you know, what would be the threat, the number one substitute that uh, that your customers could have in that industry? Well, obviously it's doing it themselves, right? Um, and so somebody can hire a lawn maintenance company or they can just buy a lawnmower and do it themselves. So that that would be sort of the number one thing. And, and as you can imagine, um, you know, from my own experience, if I was gonna hire somebody to mow my lawn, um, I might be paying the same amount of money every year for that service uh, which could be more than the cost of buying a simple lawnmower, right? So the the return on investment for someone who decides to do it themselves is is pretty immediate. You know, out of that money I would normally pay to another company, I could buy a lawnmower, and then you know, obviously there's the time cost, and that's probably what most people are thinking about. They're thinking about the effort uh, that it takes to go and do the job. 
Um, with respect to a restaurant, you know, what would be the the threat of substitution there? Well, obviously, it's people that are preparing their own meals. And it's interesting because I, I noticed this, like um, when I see the flyer come out, for example, from the local grocery store, they'll often have some sort of feature like, you know, this uh, wonderful steak or something like this is going to be on sale this week. And they'll they'll show images of people, you know, having a great time with family and friends around the barbecue and stuff. And, and that is targeted at saying, hey, you can have the same kind of experience as you would if you met your family and friends at a restaurant. You can do that at home with the underlying message being, of course, for a much lower cost. So, so this is how we go through and analyze these five things. And you can do this exercise with any kind of industry or business that you might be looking at. So the next one on here is the bargaining power of suppliers. So who do you need to buy from if you're going to be in this industry? And so this is going to this is going to vary depending on the industry, obviously, but you could have a supplier concentration problem. So if you were going to buy, for example, a motorcycle dealership that sold uh, Kawasaki motorcycles, your supplier would have a huge amount of bargaining power with you. Right. You, you would be competing in a market where people have many choices about which kind of motorcycle they want to buy. But you need to buy your Kawasaki motorcycles from Kawasaki. Right. So so they would have an extreme amount of bargaining power with you when it comes to the world of lawn maintenance, for example, the suppliers would be things like uh, fuel, you know, gasoline and gasoline trades at a you know global market rate. Uh, the lawn maintenance company has no control over the price of gas. Uh, in fact, if you created contracts with your customers, you know, with a homeowner saying for the season, I'm going to mow your lawn for this amount of money, and then the price of gas doubles, uh, you're just going to have to eat it probably, right? Uh, the other big one would be labor. Um, and when it comes to um, these sort of um, service businesses that might have lower paid people, um, there's going to be this huge influence on your costs that is completely outside of your control, and that would be the minimum wage. So none of these five forces are the government, but the government can have an influence on many of these forces. So for example, you know, minimum wage uh, just went up here again, uh, and so it's going to be 1525 or 1550, I think. And so for the lawn maintenance companies that may be hiring young people, you know, and paying them minimum wage, um, their cost just went up and it's completely outside their control. And not only that, uh, even if you are in a business that pays people more than the minimum wage, people will often benchmark themselves against the minimum wage. So, you know, last week the minimum wage was fourteen fifty, for example. And so somebody who earns uh, $17 an hour, they think to themselves, hey, I earn $2.50 more than minimum wage. Now that minimum wage is fifteen twenty-five, and that person is now saying, hey, I'm only earning $1.75 more. They immediately now want to have their wage increase because they look at their wage in comparison to the benchmark of the minimum wage. And so as a lot of small business owners know, uh, even if you pay more than that minimum wage, moving it up is going to have an impact all through the labor market. Everyone's going to expect to earn more money, and it's completely outside of your control. When it comes to the restaurant, for example, again, you've got labor, which is a big component, also affected in the same way by things like minimum wage. But you've also got uh, food costs and utilities. So again, if you're burning gas in the kitchen, uh, that's going to be determined by global market forces, uh, what the price of natural gas is. Uh, food costs, as you know from going to the grocery store, have experienced a huge inflation over the last couple of years. Again, the uh, restaurant has no control over that. And rent would be the big one. Um, whether you own the building or you lease, uh, you still have to take into account the value of the space. And so, um, so these are, again, framework of how you understand what it is that, uh, that you're looking at when you examine an industry. Um, bargaining power of buyers. So who are the customers and what sort of power do they have? So the, um, in the world of lawn maintenance, for example, um, you can have a couple of different groups of buyers that we could consider. So and this is where segmentation comes in. 
because not all lawn maintenance companies obviously are the same. Some of them are more tailored to working with commercial customers. Some of them are more tailored to work with homeowners, for example. And so in this market, you know, a homeowner is free to shop around. In the springtime, they might get multiple advertisements from different companies trying to get their business and they can choose from among those people. For those companies that, that you know, chase after the commercial accounts, there are going to be other ways that they can try to compete. So they might be competing, for example, based on the type of equipment that they're operating or on the size of their company. Maybe if there's a chain of fast food restaurants that has multiple locations, uh, maybe there's only certain lawn maintenance companies that actually have the size and ability to serve them properly. And so there's going to be fewer competitors in that particular kind of segment. The In the world of restaurants, again, you know, you're talking about individual customers who are going to be spending money on a meal. So people can choose to go wherever they want. There, and, and many people make a point of going to different restaurants all the time to get a different kind of experience, right? But there could be some opportunities that might exist to create a moat in that restaurant industry based around things like location, right? So this is why, for example, the concession of being the only restaurant in a national park, for example, could hold a great deal of value. We all know that at the airport, for example, you might pay more for a meal than if you are anywhere else because choice is limited by the number of operators that might be there at that airport. And so bargaining power of suppliers do the or, or of, of buyers, do the customers have power in negotiating? An extreme example of this on the other end of the scale might be uh, somebody who suffers from diabetes and needs to have insulin right? Uh, they need it. They're going to pay whatever the cost is. And so most of the businesses that are out there that we're going to be talking about exist at the other end of that, um, where there's a lot more choice. We have to be competitive. Threat of new entrants. So how hard is it for somebody to set up shop and start a new business? In the world of lawn maintenance, we could say that anyone with a lawnmower, you know, potentially could get into this industry. And new entrants may have advantages, either real or perceived. On the website, the Harvard Business Guys, uh, they point out in the airline example that if you started a brand new airline, um, you would not have employees with a lot of seniority. So your labor costs might be lower. And you would also probably be starting off by leasing brand new aircraft, which could be more fuel efficient than the aircraft operated by the industry incumbents. And so the new airline coming into that industry actually has advantages, real advantages over the established players, right? In the world of lawn maintenance, um, what you could have, for example, is you could have uh, somebody who has savings and they go and they buy a bunch of lawn maintenance equipment and they own it outright. They don't have any kind of payment and they ignore the depreciation or the fact that they're going to have to replace that equipment at some point. And so they may just be looking at their direct operating costs like fuel and labor, which could cause them to believe they can they make money at a lower price where they're not truly recognizing all of the costs that they will one day face when they have to replace equipment. So that's what I mean by a perceived advantage. They think they have an advantage. In, in reality, they don't. The, you know, that stuff is wearing out. It's going to have to be replaced. Um, the other thing too about, you know, sort of industries like lawn maintenance, um, when I think about my own neighborhood, um, you know, there's a people in my neighborhood who mow their own lawn. There are people in the neighborhood who <clears throat> hire my son to mow their lawn. Um, and his business is kind of interesting, right? Because it's an informal business where people just pay him some money to mow their lawn. He puts that money in his pocket. Uh, it's an informal business. So, I mean, he's not even facing the burden of a lot of taxes that a real business would face. Um, additionally, I can't remember him ever contributing to the capital expense of the purchase of the lawnmower, right? So his CapEx is subsidized by an outside actor, right? Me. Uh, and I don't think he's ever bought any fuel for it. So again, he's got an operating subsidy playing for him too. So if you were going to buy a lawn maintenance business, uh, that's one of your competitors. Someone whose real cost structures are skewed by outside forces that make him able to deliver that service at a very low price. At the other end of the scale, 
a couple, uh, you know, I guess if we move further along the line, um, there's a guy who comes around with an old pickup truck towing a trailer with a couple of lawnmowers and a few fellows that, you know, use the trimmers and that kind of thing. And so his capital equipment is kind of ragtag and, sh and shabby looking, right? So he's not reinvesting a lot. He's trying to make as much money as he can. He's trying to, you know, milk the cash flow as well as he can. And so the appearance of the operation is not that great, but, you know, they mow the lawn, they do a good job, right? And so he's trying to make money with the low prices that are in that industry. A couple blocks from me, <clears throat> there's a far ritzier neighborhood with much bigger houses. And over there, there are still people that mow their own lawn, right? There are people that make that choice. But there are also these other lawn maintenance companies that come into that neighborhood where the vehicles are nice and shiny and they're beautifully deckled and the equipment is all very new looking and they show up with five or six people to do the work all at once who are all uniformed with really nice outfits on and it's a very professional looking operation. And so, you know, that's a different market because the, the people who own those homes, like, are they just paying to have their lawn taken care of, right? Because they could do it themselves or they could hire the guy with the pickup truck, but they don't. So they hire the fancier operation. So are they just paying for the lawn maintenance or are they also making some kind of status signaling, right? It's the same as, you know, they might buy a more expensive kind of car to signal status to their neighbors and friends. Well, they're also hiring a fancier lawn maintenance service because they want to signal status. They want people to see that they are using the more expensive service. So that's an example of segmentation. And, you know, the operator of that lawn maintenance business is probably thinking, hey, if I move myself up market, um, I can charge higher prices. The costs are also going to go up, but maybe there are fewer competitors in that part of the market, right? And maybe what they're, they're trying to do is get to a place where they are not just competing on price which can create an opportunity for them to have higher margins. And so this type of thinking, this type of analysis can be applied to any of these places. In, in the world of restaurants, um, talking again about threat of new entrants, um, you know, anyone with a commercial kitchen can get into the restaurant business now in the world of Uber Eats and skip the dishes. So near my house, there is a commercial kitchen which uh, is it operates as what they call a dark kitchen, I believe, in that industry. Um, so it's one commercial kitchen, but on the delivery apps, they are actually operating as 15 different restaurants with 15 different menus. And they're making it all in one place. And they're just outsourcing the delivery sales and, and money collection to the apps. And so, um, yeah, you can have new entrants in the restaurant business. Um, if you had the high overhead of a prime location on a busy street and you were paying the high rent, and now you're competing online with someone who's set up one of these kitchens in an industrial park, you know, paying far lower rent, then, then it's going to be tougher to compete with them. And the other thing too about the restaurant industry is that um, a failed or closed restaurant can create an opportunity for somebody to come in and, and literally have the same kind of advantage that we talked about in the airline industry. Um, there's a joke in the restaurant industry that the third owner is the one who makes money. So if you think about um, you know a purpose-built piece of real estate for a restaurant, someone spends millions of dollars building that restaurant building, they put all of the furnishings in, all the trade fixtures, all the counters, the plumbing, et cetera, all the equipment in there, and uh, maybe they don't make enough money to cover that overhead and they end up closing. And so the bank repossesses the building, it gets put up for sale. The person who buys it the second time around as a failed restaurant location, they're going to pay probably less money than what it costs to build, right? And so when they open their doors and start serving customers, they are going to have a lower overhead. It's going to be um, you know, easier for them to make it if they can, but a lot of the times maybe they won't make it either. And so if that a second banker has to repossess that building and then put it up for sale again, what's gonna happen is eventually that thing is going to end up being sold at a lower price and the third owner is gonna be able to actually make money with it, right? And so 
basically that third owner is operating under a capital subsidy provided by the first two failed entrants, right? So again, that's one of the things you want to consider is what is the investment to get into this thing? When um, I was working once years ago with a franchise concept and they helped a couple of people open brand new franchises. And when they saw how much it was costing these people to build out these concept stores and put all the equipment and everything in, then they struggled to make money. They realized, hey, this doesn't make sense. We can probably find people who have independent restaurants. It was a, it was a burger concept. We can probably find people with, in, with independent restaurants that aren't doing that well that could very cheaply convert their independent restaurant into one of our franchises and become this you know, burger concept restaurant. And so they completely changed their uh, acquisition methodology to go after independent operators who already owned a restaurant uh, who would be able to convert themselves for relatively small investments. So, so that is the uh, threat of new entrants. The, the next one on here, oh, the next one on here, let me go back over here. Add to stage. There we go. The next one in here is just the rivalry among existing competitors. So, so what is the rivalry? So, I did some searching, um, you know, for lawn maintenance companies in Moncton, New Brunswick. I went to yellowpages.ca and just served up, searched up lawn maintenance serving Moncton NB and got exactly 100 results. Uh, this is a metro area of about 180,000 people, right? Like, I mean, I don't know if you could think of a more competitive kind of landscape. Now, not every one of these companies is going to serve the entire area. They probably have some kind of uh, preference as to neighborhood because they're trying to keep the windshield time down for their technicians. Uh, they you know, obviously would prefer to have as many people as they can grouped tightly together. And so the real competitive landscape is probably going to be different based on the neighborhood of the city that you're in, right? And again, so so this is where segmentation or understanding what's happening within an industry is really important. The more luxurious lawn maintenance company that I mentioned earlier, they may be going all over the city or at least to all the city's nice neighborhoods, trying to get as many clients as they can group tightly together in those neighborhoods. Whereas the guy with the pickup truck is trying to maybe just stay, you know, in my general part of the city, trying to focus on that area. My son doesn't have a vehicle yet. And so he literally is focused on serving people on the street, right? Because he's got to walk the lawnmower over to their house. And so um, when you examine one of these uh, industries, you also have to get an idea of what precisely is the market that these people are, are, uh, are serving. When I flip over to restaurants, uh, it's even crazier, 451 results. Now, this is everything from, you know, a lunch counter in the airport to uh, you know, a restaurant along a busy street, to maybe even uh, you know, just a food outlet in a community college, for example, maybe in this list. We, it's all kinds of stuff. And then this you know, brings up the question of segmentation again. So um, you know, are you in the restaurant business or are you in the pizza business or the you know, Indian food business or the steakhouse business, right? And, and how do you want to further segment or diversify or or something like that. So, you know, there could very well be 451 restaurants uh, here in the city, but um, maybe if you've got an idea for, uh, you know, a Vietnamese buffet or something that is going to be really unique, you could carve out your own specific niche that maybe very few people are competing in. Um, and again, we're, we're talking about competition. We're talking about small business in, in most instances in the businesses you guys are going to be buying, uh, they are going to face competition, right? And just because there might only be one distributor of a certain kind of industrial gasket in this city, well, the competitive landscape just changes, right? Because people in this city can order industrial gaskets from other cities, right? And so the, the market and scope just changes. So when you're thinking about an industry, my general advice to people has always been, think about an industry that you have knowledge about. Um, think about an industry that you understand. 
if you have experience or knowledge in a given industry, you can then branch out to what uh, we call analogous or similar industries. So if you've been in the roofing trade, there's a lot of similarity between the roofing trade and the fence building trade, for example. It's both, both, they're, both of them are like project-based where you have to get material equipment and labor to a customer's site. There's a certain amount of planning and estimation and cost control and ordering and logistics and all that kind of stuff. You've got to operate a fleet of vehicles to get people material around. You've got certain amounts of equipment that have to be taken care of and invested in, et cetera. And so both of those industries are very similar, right? And so most people that I work with, uh, they'll have an initial industry that they're focused on, and then they'll go through an exercise of uh, trying to identify other similar analogous industries that they might also be able to transfer their skills to so that they can expand the scope of their search, right? Um, because they're, you know, in the roofing trade, then there's going to be just a, a specific number of operators available to look at within a market. But then if you expand that to fence construction and, you know, walkway, patio, concrete companies, and all the other things that are similar, you're going to have more opportunities because you're going to expand the number of targets. Anyway, I hope that was interesting for you. Uh, it gives a framework for understanding an industry. And I'll thank the people over at uh, Harvard for putting that up on their website. Um, there is a book called the Harvard Business School Guide to Buying a Small Business. And I always like to point out, it's not really about small businesses. It's more about middle market businesses um, because some of the stuff they discuss in there doesn't really translate to the Main Street space. Anyway, but it is still an interesting book to read. And with that, I'll say see you later. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. Bye. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy, go over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, and more. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go to Mark Willis at Lake Growth Financial, today's video sponsor. Mark helps people better manage their personal and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've seen others use it successfully for years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find all the interviews I've done with Mark and learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up for a free consultation to learn what this solution might look like for you.